Faradi Bapaklavi met the Shah in Paris where she was studying architecture and married him later that same year in December 1959. As his wife, she used her influence to support women's rights and to fund the arts, thus creating a liberal and avant-garde environment. However, the Shah's regime was accused of oppressing its people, killing opponents and being a vassal to the United States. The Iranian revolution, led by the religious leader Ayatollah Khomeini, forced the imperial couple to flee the country in January 1979, starting on a journey into exile during which the Shah soon died. Shabanu, as she is still called by her people, invited us into her home in Paris, where the last Empress of Persia is surrounded by an abundance of pictures of her family and her home country she will, in all probability, never be able to visit again. All the campaign of destabilization and immigration started much before the, re the revolution, many years before. Each time we came outside of Iran, there were so many articles which were uh, against Iran, against the monarchy, and uh, that also helped. Of course, you know, the media has effect on the opinion of the people and the public opinion of the people has effect on their policies and it has effect on the policies and the people in our countries. That is why there are all these people who were against the system used the foreign media to attack Iran. They didn't use um, the Iranian media. They had access to foreign media. They had access to foreign media and everybody else does the same because the Western media is powerful, Western media is heard and read all over the world. So whoever wants to fight a cause, they go to, to the Western media. Who may have thought, if I'm interpreting this correctly, they had something to gain by a revolution taking place? Well, this we have uh, to ask them whether this was in the short term in their benefit, I don't believe that in the long term this the stabilization of Iran uh, will be or the stabilization of the region will be in, in the benefit of anybody. And another thing that the moment uh, my husband left Iran, if he had been there, I'm sure there would have never been the inv Soviet invasion to Afghanistan. So we did, I don't think the Taliban would be here today. I don't think there would have been an Iran-Iraq war, and I don't think there would have been a Gulf War. So it was one of the most uh, important historical events in the region this century. Yes. Would you agree to that? Um, it's still very interesting for us to see that um, the whole revolution was then spearheaded by a religious leader, Khomeini, and that one of the key events, it is said by analysts now, um, of the revolution was actually took uh, took place a year before, I think 8th and 9th of January 78, when there was uh, when police fired uh, on demonstrators in the in the holy city of Qom, uh, following an article which was very or which was interpreted as being very injurious towards the Ayatollah Khomeini in the in the official Gazette Efilat, if I'm pronouncing this correctly. Would you agree with that analysis? Well, that created a problem, and if it was not that article, I think any other thing would have triggered. I think the movement was going towards this. But, but the religious leaders, were you think aware of what you have just explained, these other forces, or were they in genuine belief that they were doing the right thing for the country. How would you explain well, this this well, relation? You know, in those days, there were very, some very important religious people who were not in favor of what Khomeini was doing. But as you know, religious people never come and condemn each other in public. In private, they would do so. In private, we had contact with them. But they never said it in public. And they were very worried. And the most important thing is that even today, there are, since many years, some very important Ayatollahs in Iran who have dissociated themselves with the regime. And some of them are under house arrest. And so, some of them and their followers have been terribly mistreated because they realize that what the regime is doing is not good for the country and above all is damaging the name of the religion. 
Sorry. So there actually had been dialogue between the Shah, you yourself, and religious leaders. Yes. And it just couldn't come to well, an, you know, an unfortunately, end. Unfortunately, there was um, such a confusion then because there were so many different opinions. Everybody was meeting everybody else in the government, people trying to find solutions because it was very clear for my husband and for myself that we are going a way which is not correct. And there were groups who were encouraging my husband to, to be very strong and to suppress the, the <coughs> demonstration in a strong way. And there were other groups who had the pressure of trying to find solution by political dialogue. So unfortunately, the events were such that if the opposition put one step forward, the government in those days one put one step backward. And everybody was, there were so many problems and worries coming from everywhere that uh, everybody was trying to just uh, solve the problem that aroused that woman that day or that hour. And uh, somehow the, it was such a mass hysteria that it was very difficult to, to control. When you imagine that there were people hundreds of people who saw actually the portrait of Khomeini in the moon and they said we saw it. Or they said they saw the uh, hair of the bird of Khomeini in the Quran. So, so when he made the decision to leave, it was not necessarily a, a departure forever. The, when my husband decided to leave, it was not forever. He thought that it would calm down. After all, his army was there and he had a prime minister there, uh, but unfortunately things turned in a way that uh, brought the uh, Islamic Republic into Was it a decision you sort of discussed over a period of time, or was it a moment when he just no, said, it was we have to leave? No, it was discussed for a few days, for at least as I remember, 15 days before we left. And I remember that there were people of different walks of life would come to me and I said, that would say that if the king leaves, uh, nothing will stay anymore. And some of the uh, generals also didn't want him to leave. But uh, I always believed in his wisdom and his intelligence and uh, I always think that if he took the decision, maybe he knew what he would think. What are your memories of the actual day you left your country? Well, of course, it was a very difficult day because you, you feel that you're leaving your roots, your home, uh, all your life, your friends, your family. And uh, in the house, there were people who were working for us. From the, the guards, or the people working for us, who were of course in tears, and we were trying to encourage them that things will not be like the same, and that maybe it's not forever that we are leaving. And then we flew by helicopter to the airport, uh, which was for many days already on strike. It was almost an uh, empty airport, except from a few officials, the prime minister, who were there, and some of the uh, only Iranian media, and my husband then had some uh, direction to give to, to the chief of staff and a little interview with the uh, Iranian press. And I remember uh, what I said was that uh, Iran had been through its history, through many turmoils, and has uh, witnessed many foreign invasions, but the Iranian culture and the Iranian identity has always survived, and this is what I still believe today. And of course, it was very moving because uh, there were people who were uh, falling on my husband's uh, feet, begging him not to leave, and what we were trying to do is to encourage them to keep their hope and their spirit. And <coughs> things might change, and of course, when we, we left in the plane, uh, it was not in the idea that we would never come back. There was always hope that things might change. 
we couldn't stay in Morocco because it could have created a problem for the king. And then when we went in Bahamas, they told us you can only stay three months and not more. So we had to find another place who would accept us. And then we went to Mexico. And after Mexico, my husband had to go to America for his operation. And when we wanted to come to Mex back to Mexico, the Mexican didn't want us to come back to Mexico anymore. So uh, we, Panama accepted us, and then we ended up in, in Panama till the, the... There was even, at, I mean, at the time, there was the big hostage crisis also. Um, and there were people who said that there were deteriorating relations with the American government because they were trying to uh, negotiate the, the, the freeing of the hostages, and that your husband and yourself could be a pawn in this negotiation. Was that true, or is that a very exaggerated way you of know, looking it, at it? Uh, it was true because the Iranian government wanted to ask for the extradition uh, of my husband to Iran and uh, <coughs> created so many stories that he should be judged and so on. And then at one point in Panama, we were feeling really very unsafe because we didn't know what was happening. And especially that the, in Panama, my husband could not be operated by the American doctors. And we were very worried. Why, why could he not be operated by the American doctors? Because it's a long story, you know, if I start to tell you. Because first of all, uh, in Panama, my husband was supposed to be operated in the American hospital, which is in Panama, in the American zone. And the Panamanian government said, no, we want him to be operated in the Panamanian hospital. We said, OK, because we didn't have much choice. For political reasons, really. For whatever reason. And then uh, the American uh, doctors took a permission to come and operate in that country, as any doctor does when he has to perform an operation somewhere else. But the moment we left the island, we went to Panama City, and we were waiting, and we had mentally prepared ourselves for the operation. And none of the Panamanian doctors were there, and they said, no, the Americans are not allowed to operate. And did you have, did you have uh, um, not personal contact, but I mean, what, what was the position of the American government towards the show? Well, the position of the American government then was uh, that uh, a husband could not come back to America for operation. And what happened after this incident of the Panamanian uh, government not letting the Americans uh, to, to make the operation, uh, President Saad, Mrs. Sadat called me and I said, why don't you come to Egypt? And that was uh, really uh, a blessing for us because in those days many of our friends were calling us and telling us, don't stay in Panama, it's dangerous. So we were thinking, but where can we go? And then when uh, this happened, we decided that we would go to Egypt. Uh, and then uh, at that moment, uh, President Carter sent to envoy, and I was in the meeting uh, with my husband. And they had told him that, um, uh, first of all, he would be if he comes to America for, uh, for operation, he should abdicate because of the hostages and their families. They were afraid that it might create problems. I, I told him if my husband abdicates, there will be always his son. And even if his son is not there, there will be a second son. So if even the second son is not there, there will be always someone in the family. And then they said it's better for the hostages if you remained in, uh, in Panama. But under those circumstances, it was not sure at all. So we decided to leave. So you must have felt let down <coughs> by former allies to a certain extent. But that was uh, since many months before that. You yeah. felt already let down? No, because yeah, but the, the, the way uh, they behaved. And uh, then we took the plane. First, we were supposed to go with the Egyptian airplane. And the Americans said, no, we will send you an airplane, which was an American one. 
And on our way, we stopped at the Azores Island. And they told us that this is for refueling and uh, asking for the routing, which was strange because an airplane like this, before flying, asked for radio this routing. Uh, nothing in the middle of the trip. So we were there half an hour, 45 minutes, an hour, two hours, and not knowing what's happening, and they were just creating excuses that we were waiting for, uh, for permission to fly. And then we flew and we arrived in, in Egypt. And this is afterwards that in a book published by Mr. Salinger, uh, he said that in that time we kept in the Azores because the foreign minister of Iran then, which was Mr. Qutb Sadeh, who was then executed by the same regime, was talking to the State Department and trying to get us back to Panama and saying that if they go back to Panama, they will give the hostages, the hostages from the hands of those who were near the embassy to the government. But somehow it was in March, in the middle of March, and it was during our New Year um, holidays. And he, I guess he couldn't gather the Revolutionary Committee and they couldn't decide. And this is how we arrived in Egypt. And this is, that was the first time after all these travels around the world that we really felt uh, safe and at home with your friends. Your going away from Iran, as you explained, was quite quickly and you had other thoughts on your mind. You left a lot of personal belongings back there, which are part of everybody's life. Did you ever get them back? It's not that I was unable to. Uh, it was that I didn't want to. Uh, you know, when you, you leave your country your, or your life, uh, material things of life have little importance. You want to just get rid of everything material. I, I know you, you, you love Paris very much. You were actually studying architecture here before you married the Shah. Does that bring a lot of memories? And did you, where did you meet the Shah in Paris? Uh, yes, I, I was studying architecture in Paris, and the first time I met him from close was in, uh, in Paris when he was receiving a group of students. And of course I was very You happy. were among them. I was among them and very happy and very honored to see them from close. I remember I wrote to my mother how happy I was to see him from so close. And then uh, after I returned to Iran, uh, this is where I really met him and then ended up to our engagement and uh, marriage. Are there any regrets? Is there anything where you say now, I or we should have done that differently? Of course, on, uh, with the hindsight you say, we wish we had done this, we wish we had done that. Uh, but then you tell yourself, uh, as Einstein said, with all the energy of the world, we cannot go one second backwards. So let's not think of the past and think of today and to the future. And again, I'm telling you, I'm not a person that is always like this. And like everybody else say, oh, I wish we had done, why did I do this, why did I do that? But then again, it's no use because the gone, the past is past.